And I'll share the screen. Thank Joe, do you right. remember which one we finished on yesterday or last week? I Feels like we're yesterday. It's been six. very crazy. Yeah, you're oh, there. Number six. six. The we've ability to perceive. Yes. Oh. Okay. One last one for uh, Era and the Ego. You bumped up. Ooh. You want okay, to say Yeah, did we go? I don't think we did number six. Oh, we didn't do number six. Oh, sorry. We start. Okay. I don't think okay. so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, doesn't look familiar right. to me. That's what you meant. Sorry. Who's going to read it? I'll go ahead and read. Okay. The ability to perceive made the body possible. Because you must perceive something and with something... That is why perception involves an exchange or translation, which knowledge does not need. The interpretive function of perception, a distorted form of creation, then permits you to interpret the body as yourself in an attempt to escape from the conflict, conflict you have induced. Spirit, which knows, could not be recoiled are reconciled with this loss of power because it is incapable of darkness. This makes spirit almost inaccessible to the mind and entirely inaccessible to the body. Thereafter, spirit is perceived as a threat because light abolishes darkness merely by showing you it is not there. Truth will always overcome error in this way. This cannot be an active process of correction because, as I've already emphasized, knowledge does not do anything. It can be perceived as an attacker, but it cannot attack. What you perceive as its attack is your own vague recognition that knowledge can always be remembered, never having been destroyed. Well, that's a head twister. Cool. <laughs> Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hi, Jane. You came in right at the right time, Jane. <laughs> yeah, no warm up for you, just diving in. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I vote going through it line by line. Yeah. The ability to perceive made the body possible because you must perceive something with something. Okay. That makes some kind of abstract sense to me. That is why perception involves an exchange or translation, which knowledge does not need. So, is he saying here that knowledge is a solid thing and perception is something up for interpretation and translation? That's what it seems to say. Does anyone have a different hit of that? No, that makes sense. It's why I think, um, you know, we, we logically go through or we think we're going logically through something to come to a decision, but it's involving interpreting all this information, whereas if we just know it, which is what we do initially, we know the answer, but then it's hidden, so we come up with all this other explanation as to why why this is so or why we make this decision. The interpretive function of perception, a distorted form of creation, then permits you to interpret the body as yourself in an attempt to escape from the complex for the conflict conflict you have induced. So let's look at that line. Interpretive function. Because it's true, we interpret the world around us through our own perceptual filters. So it is a distorted form of creation because we're not really seeing the creation in its true form. We're seeing our interpretation of it. Then permits you to interpret the body as yourself in an attempt to escape from the conflict you have induced. So I'm interpreting the conflict that we have induced as the, um, the 
the tendency to see everything separate from ourselves, like like fractured, like not one and seeing through the eyes of the ego. Does everybody else get the same thing or do you see something different? That's exactly what I see. The lessons that we're up to um, in the Facebook group is, um, I think it's 1.30. It started about 1.36. It was talking about how disease is um, and sickness is just we create that. It's our own responsibility kind of thing. And it's our body, you know, because our body isn't real. Um, we're making all this up about the body and the stuff that we need to process to become whole. Sickness is a separation. So when 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 we're sick or diseased, it's a way of separating from the collection, the connection from everybody else. That's what I'm getting from the lessons. Which kind of that makes sense. Feels like it slots in here. Yeah. Okie dokie. I'll go on. Mm. Spirit which knows could not be reconciled with this loss of power because it is incapable of darkness. This makes spirit almost inaccessible to the mind and entirely inaccessible to the body. I found these couple lines really confusing. Does do you guys have any clue on what that is? I mean, it's not that confusing, but I'd just like to hear other people's interpretation of it. Well, it does make me wonder how we know and how we connect with spirit if it's not with our mind, not with our body. Spirit's something else, and it's like, well, how do we make the connection then? There's my... I don't use how much anymore, but it's coming up here. And what I don't get is that spirit which knows could not be reconciled with this loss of power. I'm trying to figure out what is the loss of power they're referring to. The interpretive function of perception? I think so because we're not we're not creating um, from spirit. We're creating from perception. Oh, okay. And then it says because it is incapable of darkness. Okay, that makes sense. This makes spirit almost inaccessible to the mind, entirely inaccessible to the body. <clears throat> is it because everything that we're experiencing is perception? Therefore, we're completely detached from spirit because that's how I experience life. It's like everything is really a perception until we get into right-minded thinking and choose to see everything as this eternal oneness. Mm. Um, do yeah, people understand yeah. those two sentences better? I think I do now. Does Does it help to break it down like this for it's, you guys? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and I was going to say, say that. Yeah. What was, was that, say that? Yeah, I was going to say that. Um, you know, in my case, and and I guess in probably everyone's case, um, the mind. If the mind doesn't catch the spirit and doesn't can't perceive it, then it's done for with the body, and so then the body is going to continuously act accordingly in the dark in you know in illness in separation and it's the body that keeps the score the body that's screaming at us saying wake up um you know get out of the darkness and so yeah so so that that speaks to me on on a on a visceral level because that's well, how we live out our lives. The thing that makes sense to me is that I've had minor experiences of this, but I believe this to be true, is that when 
when a person experiences um, a, a unconditional love and appreciation for God, our vibration rises very high, rises very high. When that happens, disease gets eliminated. Yes. I remember once yeah. when I was much younger, I had this huge mole on the top of my head. I couldn't even brush my hair because of this big mole. And they said it was cancerous and it was, <laughs> you've got one too, Joe. And had one. Um, had one? Mm -hmm. Had it cut out. But every okay, time I, I have used something. it, or a comb, it would just stab it, poke right through it. I hurt. If it ever happens again, let me know. I just found uh, a thing that actually um, kills moles. I just did it on, on myself. As I get older, I'm getting all moly. And I thought, oh, hell no, I'm not going to look like a, Mol like moly, a spotted right? leper. <laughs> so, so I had this big bowl, and it was hurting, and it was awful. And, and I had this experience in a training where... I went to sleep that night, like in this divine state of gratitude. I mean, I was crying. It was just like I was so grateful to God. And I was just in this really, really high state, unlike anything I, I've been in, in recently, that's for sure. But this really high state. And I woke up the next morning, I went to cut my hair, and the mole was gone. It was like completely gone. And I, I searched my pillows on my bed. It was like the thing was as big as a dime. I was like, where the hell is that thing? It just disappeared. And I was like, wow. So I do think that when the body becomes aligned to the spirit and the body is vibrating in that frequency of love and gratitude, the body heals. The problem is, is that when we get ill, it's very rare that we can get into that peak emotional state. Yeah, And that's, that's where... That's where we get compromised. That's where we get hobbled. And then we just now have to say again. That's the separation. Yeah, that's the total separation. And that's when we get like all hobbled by by allopathic medicine and start to kill ourselves slowly with all this stuff. Not that I, I mean, I think, you know, uh, modern medicine is really awesome for certain things. But boy, for the maintenance of our bodies, not so much. Not so much. Not for treating symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So, um, where are we? I lost the power. This makes so spirit. Okay. Become error in this way, I think. Is that what we're up to? I think it's thereafter. I think this thereafter. makes spirit almost inaccessible to the mind, entirely inaccessible to the body. Thereafter, spirit is perceived as a threat because light abolishes darkness merely by showing you it is not there. Now, that's something that I like. I'm trying to wrap my head around it, and because I probably I haven't experienced that yet, I'm not. Well, no, maybe I have experienced it. Therefore, but I, I've never thought of the thought that spirit is perceived as a threat by the mind. Mm -hmm. Has anyone else experienced that? Yes. Uh, maybe I have. Is, is that what that internal battle is where you're just bickering with yourself here and there? I, I well, for me in, anyways, what I think it boils down to is um, that when you think about really being really being one with God, really being one with God, and not having an identity, it's terrifying. Because I've been there only once, and I think I've shared that with you guys, but I, I remember thinking, I don't think I could hang out here in this state of ecstasy forever. It's like, uh, I, don't think I, could, I don't think I would want to. That was my thought. And I thought, oh, because I'd get bored. And that's when I was like dropped back down to my body. Like, <laughs> you can only hang out here for like three seconds, buddy. It's like, get back down there in the mud. <laughs> You're not evolved enough. 
Um, and I just think that um, I remember feeling that, that, oh no, like if this is the highest place where you can ascend to, and this is total ecstatic bliss and love. And then, you know, after about a minute of that, I'm thinking, ah, I'll be bored. I, I, I don't think I can hang here. <laughs> Thinking, oh well, how advanced is that? You know, like not very. <laughs> Give me some drama. Uh, oh my God, I'm a Leo. Has to be. <laughs> it, that uh, that's it. That is. <laughs> that must be it. But you know what it says. You know that like like to to view the light as a threat. It's a it's a threat to the individual to your individuation, and we all. You know, it's like, well, for me, I'll just speak for myself. It's all rainbows and unicorns until you actually really get there. And you really have to evaluate whether you're willing to give up your identity, your body, your desires, your relationships, um, or your imagined and perceived future and the things you wanted to achieve. All those things go bye-bye. They don't exist. And that when those things are swept away, it's frightening. So well, I'm glad we stuck on this this line because, yeah, I can see how that's true. Has anyone experienced anything kind of like that where it's like, oh, if I reach God, I, I kind of disappear. Anybody else other than me? Not really, but I'm seeing this from a lower perspective, I guess. Um because light abolishes darkness merely by showing you that darkness is not there. That's what it's saying, isn't it? Yeah. So when you've got, um, when you come across superstitious people or people who believe in witchcraft and this kind of thing, it it seems to me that for them, spirit must be a threat because they're, you know, without the darkness, then their beliefs are nothing. Well, it's like, it's like, everyday christianity you know like they've yes. got more in the belief they focus more on satan than they do christ yeah i mean they it's all about the devil and the devil does this and the devil does that and you know i'm like oh my god you know <laughs> yeah Okay, I'll, I'll complete. Thereafter, the spirit is perceived as a threat because light abolishes darkness merely by showing you it is not there. Truth will always overcome error in this way. This cannot be an active process of correction because, as I've already emphasized, knowledge does not do anything. It can be perceived as an attacker, but it cannot attack. What you perceive as its attack is your own vague recognition that knowledge can always be remembered, never having been destroyed. Okay, does anyone have any feedback on that? Because it seems to be elevating knowledge. Um, for me... I'm thinking that, you know, when you have to make a decision, when I have to make a decision, um, there, there's already an answer, but I'll often suppress it, and that answer is the knowledge, but I'll suppress it so that I can logically, I can think through it. And that's the perception getting in the way of the knowledge. And I know that sometimes I hear something and I go, well, of course, and it's something that I haven't heard before, but it just makes sense. And then for me, that's that must be like the, the, remem the remembering of what I already know. And we spend so much time learning things that are not attached to spirit. <clears throat> Does anyone else have some insight on onto that? That was that was great, V. Thanks. Okay. We'll buy that one, V. Right. <laughs> no one has anything else to say about it. Yeah. Who'd like to read number seven? 
I'll put my hand up then. Okay. God and his creations remain in surety and therefore know that no miscreation exists. Truth cannot deal with errors that you want. I was a man who remembered spirit and its knowledge. As a man, I did not attempt to counteract error with knowledge, but to correct error from the bottom up. I demonstrated both the powerlessness of the body and the power of the mind. By uniting my will with that of my creator, I naturally remembered spirit and its real purpose. I cannot unite your will with God's for you, but I can erase all misperceptions from your mind if you will bring it under my guidance. Only your misperceptions stand in your way. Without them, your choice is certain. Sane perception induces sane choosing. I cannot choose for you, but I can help you make your own right choice. Many are called, but few are chosen. Should be all are called, but few are ch few choose to live them. Therefore, they do not choose right. The chosen ones are merely those who choose right sooner. Right minds can do this now, and they will find rest unto their souls. God knows you only in peace, and this is your reality. I'm rereading it. I love that line. Many are called, but few are chosen. Should be all are called, but few choose to listen. Yes. Personally, I think this is a really clear paragraph. Does anyone have any questions or anything they'd like to add or elaborate on? I'm not sure what it means. Truth cannot deal with errors that you want. Um, so I guess the errors are the not right, not right thinking. And you think well, you it, want them, but it's not the truth. It's what I what I just said, you know, when when I, I was like, oh, I'm in the state of ecstasy and oh, I think I'll get bored. So, I mean, I could be given that, but can I stay there and maintain it? My wrong thinking was not sustainable, or it was that was sustainable. My my blissful state was not sustainable. So I think that's what it means. It's like we wrong thinking cannot stay in a place of purity. Right. At least that's how I interpret it. Yeah, that makes sense. Does anyone have any questions about this this paragraph number seven? Jane, you good? Joe, you good? Yeah, I think I'm okay. Okay. Just taking taking some notes. That's all. Okay, Jane or Joe, do you want to read the next paragraph? Beyond perception. Perception. Yeah. yeah beyond said, perception. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear oh. me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can. I have said that the abilities you possess are only shadows of your real strength and that perception, which is inherently judgmental, was introduced only after the separation. No one has been sure of anything since. I have also made it clear that the resurrection was the means for the return to knowledge, which was accomplished by the union of my will with the fathers. We can now establish a distinction that will clarify some of our subsequent statements. I have a question. Um, some of the paragraphs i i was interpreting the word knowledge to be um not great but here it says i have also made it clear that the resurrection was the means for the return to knowledge 
which was accomplished by the union of my will with the Father's. So in this paragraph, it's sort of saying that, you know, knowledge is part and parcel of the union of Christ and God. Is anyone else confused about the word knowledge other than me? I want to say a few pages back that knowledge was spoken of in, in a good fashion, and then it started shifting, which yeah, yeah that's it's what I thought too. I thought I thought knowledge was um, was it was knowledge versus perception, and perception was the problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah, yeah. I think you may be right, V. Yeah. what we what we do with knowledge we use it as a as a as a, a tool or a weapon or any number of things yeah where yeah. knowledge is not the doing of anything yeah because knowledge doesn't do it can't attack i remember that line knowledge can't attack yeah. right only perception can Jane, you want to, or Joe, you want to hit number B1, Beyond Perception? Oh, that's what you've just read. Yeah, can we just can we do the next one? Oh. Number two. Number two. Yep. yep. <clears throat> Since the separation the words create and make have been confused. When you make something, you do so out of a specific sense of lack or need. Anything made for a specific purpose has no true generaliz generalizability. I've never seen that word before. <laughs> Gen oh, generalizability. Yeah, that sounds better than my mumble. <laughs> when, you, when you make something to fill a perceived lack, you are tactically implying that you believe in separation. The ego has invented many ingenuous thoughts, or excuse me, many ingenuous thought systems for this purpose. None of them is creative. Inventiveness is wasted effort, even in most ingenuous form. The highly specific nature of invention is not worthy of abstract creativity of God's creation. That makes total sense. Do you guys get that? Yes, but. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time making things on, on our on our little in our little worlds. Um, and creating is a great thing, but we have to make things to to keep going on our 3D lives. So yes, sometimes I have feel that separation of, well, these are things we need to do to keep going um, versus um, this higher plane stuff where we could sit there and contemplate our navels, but there's still no stuff still needs to get done. No, I, I, I understand that. I think, I, I keep coming back to, I don't have anything to really tether this to, but I keep coming back to um, that it's not what we're doing, it's the state of mind we do it in that makes it more of a, a separation or more of a unification. So, you know, I think about like, I, like I've been creating curriculum for all week and thinking, you know, I'm, I, I can't think anymore. That's what I've been thinking. And, and getting to this place where um, I'm not enjoying it. But then when I get done with a piece, I'm like, oh, that's going to be really good. Like, that's a really good process. And then it feels creative. Like, you know, I've created something that is going to be viable and help people and all of that. And then that feels uplifting and freeing. I... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say here other than um, the idea of making and creating is confusing. 
Mm. But that helps a bit, Gary, because, yeah, if you're producing something and um, even as you're going through the process, you're feeling it in a state of love and contribution um, versus just making stuff because it will make money. Um, yeah. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a big contrast in that. Yeah, I mean, if I was, you know, on an assembly line making widgets um, all day, I would feel like not great. That would be pretty horrible existence. Assembly line yes. works. So it sucks. I did not do well. My brain, I just, brain wouldn't let me do it. I know. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll read next number three. If no one has any more questions about number two, are you guys good? Okay. Knowing we have already observed, knowing as we have already observed does not lead to doing. The confusion between your real creation and what you have made of yourself is so profound that it has become literally impossible for you to know anything. Knowledge is always stable and is quite evident that you are not. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Right. <laughs> None, nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, you are perfectly stable as God's created you. In this sense, when your behavior is unstable, you are disagreeing with God's idea of your creation. You can do this if you choose, but you would hardly want to do it if you were in your right mind. <clears throat> That makes sense. Yeah. So knowledge is always stable. <laughs> I love that. It is quite evident you are not. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my line tonight, Joe. Okay. Knowledge is stable, but it's evident I am not. <laughs> Maybe I'll use one after it then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. In this sense, when your behavior is unstable, you are disagreeing with God's idea of your creation. There's something that, that, that gets switched on in me when I read that, when it says you are disagreeing with God's idea of your creation, which is really powerful for me because, you know, you think about we're all creating something. And um, if God's idea of my creation is to create oneness and to create a sense of, um, well, I can't speak for God, but I'll just make it up out of my own ego. But a sense of, of not only oneness, but contribution to others to make more of a heaven than a hell here. If, if that's God's idea of my creation, or I'm if I make something that's unstable or that's um, annoying or that's not um, contributive or that is criti critical of others, then my creation is not in alignment with God's idea for me. And I personally kind of love that. Um, if I think about what's God's idea of my creation today and how can I be in alignment with that idea, that gives me some kind of little boost to think higher. I don't does it do that for you guys? I love that idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely gives you that higher perspective of, you know, what am I doing here right now? And is it serving what um what I'm actually here to do? Yeah. I mean, every morning when I sit down to meditate and struggle for 45 minutes <clears throat> until I can focus my mind, I'm always saying to myself when I begin, like, this time is devoted to God. Like, this time I can think about anything, all anything else that I normally would think about all day long. But this time, this hour and a half, this is devoted to God. And still I struggle. But at least I'm telling myself this, you know. This is my time to devote to God. Who'd like to read number four? Or was it number three? Number four. 
I'll do that one. Yeah. The fundamental question you continually ask yourself cannot properly be directed to yourself at all. <laughs> okay, guys, my question that I put before. You keep asking what it is you are. This implies that the answer is not only one you know, but is also one that is up to you to supply. Yet you cannot perceive yourself correctly. You have no image to be perceived. The word image is always perception related and not a part of knowledge. Images are symbolic and stand for something else. The idea of changing your image recognises the power of perception, but also implies that there is nothing stable to know. Mm. It's really interesting when it says you cannot perceive yourself correctly. You have no image to be perceived. Hmm. I guess that's, you know, historically true because at the end of the day, you know, when it's all said and done and we're dust, we are, our consciousness is what we are and that consciousness is always like one with the divine so if we if we have no body we don't have an image we have i don't think it's part of knowledge i think knowledge is a knowingness of our divine source and our divine um our own divine creation We have no image to be perceived. Images are symbolic and stand for something else. Mm. So it seems as if, you know, this eternal truth that we keep coming across always in the course is that we are beyond definition, that we're one with God all the time, that there is no perception and that there is no, um, there is no separation. <clears throat> Hmm. this is why i get a little confused where it says the idea of changing your image recognize the power of perception which is of course inherent in changing your image but also implies there is nothing stable to know so i don't know how it implies that because it's the it's the perception versus knowledge thing again. I think change your image, recognize the power of perception, which is which is um, contradicting knowledge. Okay, I can see that. Here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's all temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the trainings that you do, Gary, with um, you know the images that we create to help us shift our thinking, to help us shift how we're feeling about a particular situation or how we feel about ourselves. Or you know, we're using images, we're using the power of images to change our perception. Um, and I think that's a great tool. Perception is probably the tool then. But knowledge is beyond that. Well, <clears throat> a lot of the way that people uses use the images to represent like a gestalt from the subconscious mind, because you can't pull all the thoughts and the experiences apart and work on them individually. You have to get some sort of symbology of what that whole emotional state is and there you can start making changes. Um, at least that's been my experience thus far. So it it is almost as if, you know, when you represent the illusion by a symbol, 
um, some sort of imagined form, which is from the subconscious, and you you change that, it has this massive reverberating effect that turns it back into where it was issued from. It, it becomes illusionary. It doesn't exist. It becomes neutral, like it was never anything to begin with. Then it just becomes neutral, which I think, you know, the more I do this work, the more fascinated I am on how when you work with, with the, sim, the symbols of illusion and you scrabble them up or you reimagine them differently with the same mind that created them, they become a nothing burger. They just become flat and inconsequential. And that's what I think is really fascinating. Yeah. Take the charge away from it. Yeah, and if the if the emotions aren't there, it it kind of becomes the illusion it always was. Beautiful. Who goes next? Okay. Okay. Well. Um, okay, Jay. Okay. Uh, five, right? Yes. Knowing is not open to interpretation. You may try to interpret meaning, but this is always open to error because it refers to the perception of meaning. Such incongruities are the result of attempts to regard yourself as separated and unseparated at the same time. It is impossible to make so fundamental a confusion without increasing your overall confusion still further. Your mind may have some, may have become very ingenious, but as always happens, when method and content are separated, it is utilized in a futile attempt to escape from an inescapable impasse. Ingenuity is totally divorced from knowledge because knowledge does not require ingenuity. Ingenious thinking is not the truth that shall set you free, but you are free of the need to engage in it when you are willing to let it go. Hmm. So incongruities are part and parcel of the separation and simply a result of the attempt to regard yourself as separated. Well, there's something really beautiful about ingenuity. It says ingenuity is totally different from knowledge because knowledge does not require ingenuity. Ingenious thinking is not the truth. Is not the truth that shall set you free. But you are free of the need to engage in it when you are willing to let it go. Which in my mind means that when you are willing to be ingenious and then, then discard ingenuity because whatever you're attempting to create through your perception is not going to be real anyways. When it says, but you are free of the need to engage in ingenuity when you are willing to let it go. Meaning when you're, when you're willing to disengage from in, ingenious thinking. Which brings me to what V said earlier, uh, a bit of a conflict because... Um, I think ingenious thinking has has is the fuel that drives innovation and the fuel that drives this. I mean, it is an illusion. We can all agree to that, but we're living in it and we think it's real. But 
yeah uh, that kind of that kind of baffles me a bit anybody else feel a little baffled by that No one else other than me, huh? <laughs> no, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was baffled as well. Does anyone have a have a clear insight into this? I always come back to goal setting and um, the degrees of success, and not so much in my achieving of goals. And how you know we discussed quite a bit of this in the past about. Um, you know, setting your intention but letting it go. Don't worry about, like, you know, you, you go through your day and you do, um, you act in accordance with your values, um, but you don't continuously, oh. you don't continuously dig at this goal. You don't continuously try to achieve it and go, how am I going to do this and come up with all the little details of it. You've got to surrender to, um, to a higher power as to how it's going to get achieved. Thank you for that, V, because that, that gives a whole other spin on it for me. Um, I I read, I heard this today. I, I was on my LinkedIn page getting some testimonials from people that left testimonials for me. And and I was just scrolling through LinkedIn, what people posted. And I, I can't, I was going to use this as my closing statement tonight, but I'm going to read it now as we're almost at time. It says, what if everything you are going through is preparing you for what you have asked for. And I just thought, I love that. And I thought that's very much what this is kind of saying. It's like, we we create, we generate ideas, we work hard, we do all those things. But if that's what we do here, and, and then when we let it go, when we surrender it over to something higher, that returns it back to, you know, the concept of oneness. That returns it back to to all of that. It returns it back to, to I think, the Holy Spirit. I don't know how we can flow through life without putting out massive effort. And maybe that's just me, but I always feel like I, I require to put out massive effort to create what I want to create and what I envision. But then I surrender it over and say, you know, give me the strength and the courage to face my destiny with joy. And that means whether I fail or whether I succeed, it kind of doesn't matter. But I get what you're saying here, V, and I think that makes the whole paragraph feel right to me. I mean, it doesn't feel wrong. It just now I understand it more. Even our failures, not they're not mistakes or failures. No, true. Yeah. True. But if you really think about what that sentence says, you know, what if everything you're going through is preparing you for what you've asked for? Okay. And I think what we've asked for is what we focused on. So if we really think about and are authentic with ourselves, what our mind is focused on throughout the day every day for years that we've been on the planet i know my mind hasn't been focused in a great place it's mainly been focused on fear scarcity blah 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 some sort of narrative and and of course you know that's slowly beginning to turn around because i've shifted what i focus on but um yeah it's almost like our our destiny before us is the answer to the prayer that we've set forth. Yeah. I don't know when it started, but I, I, I can't remember if it was starting to read this, or it might have been something before this, where um I started to examine my thoughts a lot more, like um and how I was feeling during the day. Because it's so easy to just, you know, your mind just goes on to the same track it's always had. And you think that's normal, but if you can change, if you can change the trajectory just a little bit during the course of the day and change what you're thinking, you know, and recognize that sometimes you're thinking something horrible about someone 
and just going, just sending out love instead. It's it's simple, yeah. but it's not easy. It's almost like like um, like a rocket ship going to another planet. If it's off uh, in the beginning of its course, if it's off the trajectory by by a foot or a few centimeters or an inch, by the time it reaches its destination, it's you know, hundreds of thousands of miles off. So the smallest little adjustment we can make to our thinking actually keeps us on course. Otherwise, if we continue to think these small thoughts that we think are inconsequential, at the end of our lives, our lives can be in a completely different point and destination than what I feel, you know, we all would want from our, you know, our, our most heart's desire. So I think it's very interesting. Um, that one line. And genius saying he is not the truth that shall set you free, but you are free of the need to engage in it when you are willing to let it go. <clears throat> yeah, because letting it go is a nod to to your faith. Yeah. In, in your alignment with your source. Yeah. And always knowing that the how we don't we don't come up with the how no. we may think we do but really it's the how is is uh is being created and given to us from god and our source yeah i i think it's very true that each one of us have a destiny and how we rise up to meet that destiny, I think we have some some choice in that. But I do think we have all of us a destiny. Like V, why are you living in Australia and you get to play with horses and have and have this great guy that you hang out with who's goofy and wild and pushes your buttons so that you can look at yourself and and I'm here hung, hanging out in the mountains of Arkansas of all places in a pine forest with, you know, my partner and his aging mother, you know, who just goes on oh, like the ever ready bunny. You know? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And uh, how did this happen? You know, like sometimes I look at Robert and I said, how did we get here? And, um, but we're here and it's, um, and it's, it's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah, and you know, you know, it's no accident. Oh, it's absolutely zero accident. I had some really good friends of mine that are old clients. <clears throat> she called me, and she was really struggling in San Diego, like really struggling, like they were, they were really struggling. And I said, "Darling, come to Hot Springs, um, check it out. Come to Arkansas, check it out." They did. They moved immediately. She called me up from Little Rock because they chose to move to Little Rock. They moved to Little Rock. It was about 45 minutes from me. And she said, we have an entire spiritual community that we've built, and we want you to come and visit with us and have a potluck with us. Will you come? And I was like, I am there with bells on. So I think it's, uh, I think it's all destiny. I really do. I think it's all destiny. I'm trying to get people to move here because it is such a, a cool place to live and it's so inexpensive and all of that. Um, so I think you that- your, You have your Christian neighbor down the street who is as good as gold and has a heart the size of Texas, right? He does, he does. In fact, he just dropped by yesterday. I hadn't seen him all summer. He was in Wisconsin doing- building out some sort of storage facilities for a group of investor friends of his. And uh, yeah, they just dropped by and uh, it's just, it's just beautiful to live in a community where there's um, there's people that are conscious that are kind and that um, it's beautiful here. So it's a good place. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, gang, Shall we read our statements? Joe, you go first, you little devil. <laughs> God knows you only in peace. 
Cool. Jane, do you have a word or a statement? <clears throat> yeah, I am never in separation, even when I think I am. Thank you. B? The line comes from that little quote of changing. Many are called, but few are chosen. Should be all are called, but few choose to listen. So I'm saying I'm listening. Yay. <laughs> and mine is um, to always quiet my heart and my mind. All things past, present, and to come is gently planned that unconditionally loves us. Mm. All things. All things. Okay, gang, I'm going to go to sleep because I am very what tired. <laughs> yes, I know. Okay, gang, God bless you all. We'll see you next Tuesday. Stay out of trouble. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>